we're looking to step up our painting game. So we're going to use the best of the best. And this is a semi, this is for semi smooth surfaces. Doesn't have to be smooth, doesn't have to be semi. This is a very fine applicator. And of course, it is a lambskin roller, as you can see. And part of the process to get a beautiful finish on the wall we're painting is to replace your rollers when necessary. Okay, this is something that can be used perhaps for uh, paste as I do wallpaper, but not for the finish we're looking today. So we're replacing it. And if you take notice on this roller, very important. This actually allows you to paint adjacent walls. You see the, the way they're making rollers today. They're actually putting the applicator on the side. And so it's not just for here. And they make 9-inch rollers and beyond as well. It's a good, good product. As you know, I highly suggest anybody using a paint applicator use water on the applicator before you put the paint onto this thing. Why is that? These applicators are going to draw the liquid from the paint to absorb it so that it can do its job. Well, if you then try to paint with this thing, you go, your first several square yards are going to be disproportionately applied because this is sucking the liquid from the paint. And the first couple of square feet is going to be paint applied with less liquid on the wall because it's sucked into this. So the way to do that is to saturate your roller first. And I'm just going to spin them. I'm going to do something like this in the bucket. I don't want to get hit in the face with it. So I'm going to spin it like that into the bucket just to make it damp. I'm not looking to make it wet. I'm just looking for it to be damp. And so I put it on the bucket, something like this. And as you know, I think I've shown you this before on video, very good technique. You put the roller in the bucket so that it doesn't spray in the face. And as you can see, it does a very nice job of spinning it, right? And that's all you want. Now it's damp. Remember, please don't soak your roller or your, or your brush. And this one, I'll just take the chance. For this one, I'll just take the chance to do it so that you can see it. And of course, you would want to have a bucket or something covering it. As you can see there, spinning very nicely. Okay, now it's sufficiently wet. And your roller, you see how the roller looks now? You can see basically the plastic that holds it together. You can see down into it. That's how you want it. Okay, so when we are mixing the paint, we I, yeah, you, you uh, may have a clean bucket rather than go pay for this thing. I use a lot of joint compounds, so nice and clean in there, no water. And if you like this color, by the way, it's called, it's the Sherwin-Williams Designer Edition, very expensive paint. Um, if you want a discount, just let me know in the sections. I'll let you have my discount. And this is the color 2063-10 Old Navy. Okay? Uh, you might like it, you might not. Now, this is a very special paint, and it's going to hide our imperfections on the wall. Okay? And the reason why I'm using this paint is because we have angular flashing on the texture on the wall. And we don't want that angular flashing making shadows on the wall. I'll explain it later on in the video. Angular flashing is the effect of the texture applier 
person who does it, applying the texture instead of straight ahead holding the applicator, he or she turns his or her wrist back and forth, applying the texture, causing the light to reflect against these texture particles at different angles. And so you might see a wall that looks dark here or there. You might think it's your paint, when in fact, it's your texture. A pro texture applier holds the hopper or the applicator at the same distance, at the same angle, consistently throughout the ceiling or the wall. When you don't, you have some texture that peaks in the middle, some texture that peaks on the left, and others on the right. And this produces the light to be trapped against these peaks, which casts different shadows. And so you get angular flashing. And you might think it's your paint, when in fact it's not. If you really want to do a good job mixing your paint, you see this paint here? It's a different color than what's in the can and what's in this bucket. The color gets trapped on the lids. You must, I'm just telling you, this is what you should do. Get this paint into this mixture. Believe it or not, when you don't have such dark colors, you can see the multiplicity of colors that are used in your particular color right here on the lid. And guess what? It takes away from the color or changes the color if you don't integrate this stuff. So, you know, you don't have to go crazy, but get that paint off of there because you'll see that the color gets trapped up in there. Okay, so we'll put it in here. We'll dump this into here. Then we'll dump this into here. Then we'll dump some of this back into what I'm going to use as a cut bucket. So I got all the residual paint out of one of the buckets, all on the sides, all at the bottom. Put it into the other bucket or the other can. Now I'm just going to integrate it into my paint. But before I mix this and consider this all integrated, I'm going to scoop out the excess in there to, and paying particular attention to around that rim. I'm talking even the inside of that rim because the color gets trapped up in there. He's showing me how to stir paint. Yes. I'm bringing it up. I'm stirring it in circles and then I'm bringing it up and then mixing. Yes, it's already been stirred by the paint store. But I've seen them do not so great jobs in stirring paint. And here's the reason. You don't want shadows on your wall. So your color has to be blue at the top, in the middle, and at the bottom. And that's why you want to get excess like that off and make sure that it gets mixed into the paint. I wouldn't spend any more than a minute doing it, but I would make sure I bring that bottom up to the top like that. You want to see something funny? The paint on the lid is dry. It's been in the sun for about, I'd say about two minutes before it was dry. Imagine. Okay, we're good now. Throughout the video, I'll have to do many voiceovers because the customer was home and they were conducting family business, but they let me make this video. This is one of the areas I have to paint. The customer did this to the wall. Interestingly, they went out and purchased paint in order to make the wall, the color that you see here and the color that you're going to see me paint this wall. But the reason I do these videos is because this is a young couple who wants to paint the wall, but they said, we really don't know how to do it. And I said, you know, how many other people in my country and around the world would like to paint their wall a special color? When you go painting your wall a dark color, it's a special application. You really have to know how to paint 
in order to do it. Let me explain why. Painting a wall a dark color sometimes requires a special primer. For example, if you want to paint your wall a dark red, let's say candy apple red, you need a gray primer. Must have it or else the red will not take. If you want to do a light yellow, guess what? You need a special primer. Be very careful if you're painting your walls anything other than brown, light brown, green. Once you start adding certain dark colors, you have to check with your paint tech to ask them if a special primer color is needed. So they wound up getting a satin or a semi-gloss and it really looked bad. As you can see in the video just a few moments ago. And they decided to paint it. What they did was they painted with a brush this color, then that color to see which one they liked. And then they found one that they liked and they decided to roll the wall with the color that you see here that I'm covering up. Well, the woman who painted it with a brush didn't realize that she was adding a texture to the wall by flattening out the texture that was on the wall by putting an excessive amount of paint on the wall. When I say excessive, she just took the brush and painted up and down. But what it was, was an excessive application, even though she didn't realize it. And what it did was it, it, it coated the bumps on the texture, so much so that it obscured them and it caused angular flashing, which is, as I was saying before when I was working outside, it causes the light to hit those bumps in a much different way than the light is hitting the bumps right next to it. And so you say, what's happening here? And so when you're painting dark, it's not the same thing as painting light colors. You really have to take advice from the pros who have gone through the problems that you're going to have when you try to do it yourself. Now I cover my base molding like you will do and I try to bring the tape right up to the point where the customer made a crooked blue line. So I paint just on the white hand side, white hand side of the customer's error and then I caulk it to clog the tape so that paint doesn't bleed underneath it. And now look at this line. How do we keep that line straight? Well, I'm going to put tape on the beige side of that, overlap it past the blue, and then caulk it. And I'll show you various techniques that you can, I'll show you some alternatives in the video on what you can do if you choose not to do it or you're not efficient at the suggestion that I make. Here's my ladder set up. I have a blue Werner bucket. I have my cut bucket, I have my roller to make the stipple at the top, and I have my little screed. So I go into the customer's restroom. Take a look at what passes as acceptable industry standards here in Florida. Look at this. Somebody caulked this above their backsplash, and look at, you can see the imprint of their finger. Look at this. They push the caulking into the corner, and then the excess on the edges, they just leave it there. Can you believe this? Folks, we have to step up our game, do it yourself first, because this is what professionals are doing. So look at this ugly wall. Now please know it's not painted yet. I didn't do this. See all of the little swatches where the customer painted it with a brush? Very, very dangerous to do that. You may actually build up your your area there and it'll never go away until you retexture the entire wall so please don't do that if that's you what I initially did was simply paint over it to see perhaps it's a chemical differential that is to say that the makeup of the paint maybe that's what's causing it to flash but it wasn't 
When I looked closer, I discovered that it was a physical alteration of the texture. It wasn't a chemical alteration. You know, sometimes people might use an oil-based paint and then, or a latex over oil, and then you might see this flashing caused by the chemical differential. In this case, it was purely physical. So I'm going to be adding texture here. In other words, I realized that by the customer told me, you know, I put a couple of coats of paint, different colors in these particular areas. So what I'm trying to tell you is that she built up the area in between her texture bumps and she put it on thick. And so it caused it to flash because there were there was less texture there because she added paint to the surface. It's a pretty dangerous thing to do in a main room like this where the light is hitting the wall. You see every imperfection. Now, my good viewers, please take a look at this issue at the top. Do you see where it's lighter? At the very top, you see those little areas where the blue is weaker? That's what happens when you only cut one time. And that's what a lot of painters do. They only cut once, not to mention the crooked line at the top. I'm going to show you in this video how to cut perfectly straight. And now remember, the theme is when painting with dark colors, you will not be needing to use the techniques in this video on lighter colors. Now, for those of you just starting out in your painting business, you would charge more money to paint with darker colors. The added pigment to the paint causes the painter to expend far more expertise, far more time in order to apply the paint. Look at how slow I have to go in order to try to draw a straight line. And you'll see I simply resorted to getting the paint up there as straight as I could make it with my hand. And then in the end, we're going to perfect the line. Please, if you don't watch the video in its, to, in its entirety, please understand that this is far from the final effect in this video. I'm just getting the paint up there. I, even if I overlap onto the, onto the trim, I want my blue up there. And then in the end, you're going to see a perfectly straight line. And I'm not going to reveal it until you watch the whole thing. There are many ways to cut a straight line. Many ways. You can use a four inch brush. In this case right here, I'm using a two and a half inch angle sash brush. Why wouldn't you want to use a four inch brush in this video right now? My friends, a four inch brush is very hard to control. If we were painting a beige or a brown or a white, go for it. Use a 10 inch brush if you can do it. But here's what happens when you use a four inch brush. You have less control over the bristles. You got so much bristles that they're bound to hit the white, bound to hit it. With the two and a half, you control the bristles more. Take a look at how many bristles are actually touching the crown molding. Just take a look here. You see, it's not many. It's just the forward edge, that left-hand side, right? With the four inch, it's going to be at least three inches of bristles hitting that trim. And they jump up and they hit the trim. Now, you see how I'm going from left to right here? And I went from right to left before that? You want to cut your texture from left to right and from right to left. Why is that? Those bumps have sides. And if you're going from left to right, you're not necessarily hitting the right side of the bump. So you want to go from left to right to make sure you get the left side of the texture bumps. And then you want to come back from right to left so you get the right hand side of those texture bumps. And then I just go back and forth because I want to clean up the paint that I just laid down. You see, I cut slow. And by the way, texture requires a lot of time, as I said. And this is why you want to charge more money. Now I go back and I clean it up. Now, let's think about 
cutting that line. I'm causing a certain texture, aren't I? I just told you my customer painted with a brush and obscured her texture. And so I had to add texture. So now I have to put the texture back on this texture, which is stipple. Your roller leaves a stipple. Okay? And you want to, you don't want to obscure that by using a brush. So you want to get a roller up there. And I'm going to show you how to do it. You could do it with the little four inch that I had, or I'm going to show you an easier way. I'm at the edge of that blue wall. And I'm go this is one way to do this. I'm going to show you a different way later. But tape the side of it and then caulk it. Put that caulking in there. Make sure that caulking gets against that tape. Brush right away. You don't wait till the caulking dries. Paint it. And then you're going to paint it again. And then you remove your tape. Please don't let that paint tape dry together. Pull the tape off within 20 minutes or so. After a while, you can't pull it off or it starts pulling on your caulking and your paint like a rubber band, believe it or not. I put a lot of paint against the caulking. And don't be alarmed if your caulking all of a sudden starts flashing like white. And you'll see that, like it won't take on the blue. It'll be showing it's white, but don't forget, it looks white, but it actually dries clear. So here I am, this is the side of the wall. Okay, there you go. It's the side of the wall. Please be careful and use masking paper and make sure that you use your tape as if you're drawing a line on that wall. You wanna hold it tight and make sure that it's a straight line up against that wall. And then you put caulking there. There's my first coat. There was my first coat. This is the dining room. I'm letting the first coat dry. Folks, I finished up very late in this house. Now I'm going to show you two ways to paint this area against the trim. On the right side, I'm going to use what's called a dry brush. On the left hand side, I'm going to use a wet brush caulking the tape. I'm going to show you the difference in what happens if you don't caulk against your tape. Can you do it? Yes. It's a little more time consuming, but if you didn't have the caulking, you can do it. This is the dining room now, and I'm using my two and a half inch brush to cut the line. Take a note on how I'm holding that brush. Why am I holding it as I would a lollipop? Why isn't my hand closer? Well, this is something that you could either do or not do. It all depends on preference. Do you know that I have more control over those bristles with my hands seven inches away from them? You see how I control the brush? I'm letting the brush do its job, the bristles, but I'm actually holding that far away. Now, if I were using a four inch brush, Oh, you couldn't give that leeway to a four inch brush. You'd have to be a lot closer. You see how the bristles don't ride up onto that trim? If you go slow. Now, hold on folks, don't leave the video. This is not my final line. This is not my final line at all. In fact, we perfect this at the very end. You'll see it in the video, how we perfect this. Let's just say that with dark colors, you, you, your line has to be perfect. I know that looks perfect from here, but up close it's not perfect. And we as painters want to make it perfect. I'm telling you right now, if you give your customers straight lines, they will, you'll be known for perfection. Why rush a job? Charge enough money to be completely satisfied at the job, even if it takes you another day. Take that into account. This could go into another day. Don't be scrambling on a job because you're losing time. You have to charge appropriately, which usually means you have to charge more money. There's no way to render perfection unless you're getting your price. Who's, who's going to want to stay in somebody's house on his own time, right? 
Charge enough money. Don't be afraid to do that. People want good work. And if they don't want good work, why would you want to work there? You have to enjoy what you do. You don't enjoy what you're doing if you're not making enough money doing it. If you love what you do, you have to get paid. You see, I turn the brush around. Do you see how I, I angle those bristles differently? So here I'm going from right to left. The, the bristles touching right now are the longer bristles. But if you want to control a more fine line, right there, you reverse the brush and you actually put the forward bristles are the ones that come, they're the shorter ones on the angle. Here I am using the longer bristles to go from right to left. But I'll turn it around, forcing the brush to be more taut. It's a more tight application of the paint. And it gives me a finer line because it's putting a lot of pressure on the bristles by bending them unnaturally. Do you know what I mean? If you look at a paintbrush and you see the angle, if you hold it straight up, you'll see bristles that are closer to the ceiling and ones that are further away, simply because it's on an angle. You see it right there. When you want to draw a fine line, you turn, those, you turn that brush on its side and paint, as opposed to what I'm doing here, you paint with the shorter bristles touching the crown. And you'll see that it gives you a finer line. Those little white specks are going to be your nemesis when you're looking to leave the job. When that paint dries and you no longer have shininess, those white line, those white dots are going to show because there's no way to get them all on the second coat. You miss, very few, but you do miss. As I'm doing this, I'm holding my breathing, I'm, tr I'm controlling it, because it will affect your arm. So there's a lot of little tips and tricks that we do. Anyway, it would come natural. You don't need me to tell you to control your breathing. You'll see that when you take big gulps of air, your arm moves and you hit the crown. Now let's remember, this is just the first cut. Please don't be lazy. I mean, I, I'm teaching painting here, so I, I feel like many people are learning from my channel. Don't be lazy and cut once. I'm telling you, people are going to notice, and once they find out that you cheat, your, your name is ruined. You owe it to people to do two coats. For those who believe in the do-it-yourselfer or the new painter, nothing covers with one coat. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Don't believe paint companies. Oh, yeah, it's one coat. I There's only one word for that, and I can't say it in public. It's not true. And for the people who say it, they don't know what they're talking about, to put it nicely. I don't care if it's Home Depot Marquee, Oh, yeah, it's one coat. No, it isn't. It's one coat for the lazy. One coat is lazy. One pass with that brush at the top is, is absolutely lazy. And plus, you're going to give them two different colors if you do it. I'm using a dry brush here. I'm trying to demonstrate that without a dripping brush, I'm going up against the side of this window without caulking. There's no caulking protecting that tape. Why would I have the guts to do that? Because I'm using a dry brush. I just have a minimum amount, a minimal amount of paint on those bristles. And you can see I'm hitting the wall to pretty much force the paint to come off those bristles. 
But if you were out of caulking, this is how you could do it. You simply brush the area going up and down, what, what I would say aggressively. You're not pushing the bristles into that tape. You're simply going along parallel to that tape. And guess what? With minimally two coats, probably three, it'll look just as good. Check it out when I look at that. No caulking there. But you know what? This is not my favorite technique. But I share it with you because you could do it. Let's say you were out of caulking or you ran out. You couldn't get to the store. You're working. It's 9 o'clock at night. Go for it. Just use a dry brush. Okay, I've come back to my wall. Remember I said after I was going to let it dry. Here I come back to it. And look what we see here. We still see after the first coat... First of all, our paint is still wet. And what's going on here? I don't like it. I decided I'm going to hit this with kills. I don't like the way it looks. And back to square one. Kills is going to seal anything that was on that wall. If it's a chemical reaction, Kills is going to keep it contained. But you know what? I discovered that it wasn't chemical, like I said. When I looked closer, upon a closer examination of the surface, I quickly realized that the customer really gummed it up. I think she put four different colors on there. And so I realized I probably did good by adding that oil. <clears throat> Because she did this all within a week. I mean, a wall needs to cure, right? So I cover it with the kills. This is the, this is the uh, paint primer you want to go to in a pinch. Uh, you keep this on your truck. You need this. And now here I go. I'm going to snowflake the wall. I'm, I'm literally at least two feet away from that wall. And I just want to put texture. I'm feathering it out. We feather paint. We feather compound when we, we uh, skim coat. I'm feathering the texture because this is, I call it dangerous. It's dangerous. You, you could risk making the wall look worse. But guess what? It worked perfectly. If you want to feather it in, stay back. The rule of thumb for adding texture from a can is 12 inches, but not when you're feathering it in. I'm 24 to 30 inches away. I just want to put a little texture on the surface just to take attention away from the flashing she made in that concentrated area. You see that? I feathered it out several feet away. Let's see how I did. I think you're gonna like it. So remember, on the right-hand side, I used the dry brush right there. Now I'm going to caulk the other side. You decide what you like best, okay? If, you're, if you don't trust yourself that you're going to get paint underneath the tape, use the caulking, okay? And, but with this procedure, you need to pull that tape within a half an hour after doing it. Don't wait. Half an hour, pull the tape. And yes, many people say to me, do I wait till the caulking dries to paint it? No, there's no need to. They're all the same base, you just paint it. Get that paint in there and go in one direction. Remember, the caulking is a substance that's thick. So you don't want to be going up and down. You, you'll see it. You'll, you'll, you'll aggravate the viscosity of it, and it'll ooze out. So just one direction, pull it nice, put a lot of paint in there, and let it dry. So remember the bathroom sink earlier in the video? We don't do that. We press the caulking in, preferably with a wet finger, and then make sure that you knock down the ridges that you may make by rolling your finger against it. That's all.
So here's another technique for treating the edge of a textured wall surface when you're using a dark colored paint. If you get this paint onto the corner or beyond the corner, folks, it's gonna look hideous. I'm showing you an aerial shot so that you can see none of the paint is getting onto the corner and none of the paint is getting onto the other side. But folks, this takes a lot of time. If this is your technique, by all means use it. The alternative I showed you was letting the paint, letting the, a, a piece of tape go over the edge and then caulking the tape where it meets the corner, thereby preventing the painter from going beyond the edge. This is a lot of time. You can imagine how much time I would have to do for a 10 foot wall, right? But if that's your thing, by all means, go for it. Now I'm, I'm shimmying that brush against the corner. Don't be afraid to go beyond that. It's not, your bristles cannot go on the other side. Take a look at the other side when I show it to you. It's safe. But look how little paint is going on there. Is this the technique you want to use? You know when you put a quarter under a sheet of paper and then you drag your pencil back and forth? This is the same idea. You see how I'm pretty much getting it blue? But look at how little paint, oh my goodness. That's gonna take four coats to do it like that. But you can do it. You can put more paint on as your, your skills avail you to, to do so, and then you can just keep doing it. This was the other alternative, by putting the caulking against the tape and then just painting it, just like that. Okay, this is the window, but the same idea would hold. You caulk it and you can go a lot faster. This is the other side of the window where we caulked it. You see I'm doing two coats, always two coats, always two coats. And you finish in one direction, right? We, we go back and forth so violently because we have this texture. I mean, we don't want to take an all day, but then you finish, look at that, one direction, right? Why is he going up? You can go down. It doesn't matter. One direction, though. Well, I shouldn't say it doesn't matter. It does matter in the finish. This is not the finish. This is just prepping. We're prepping, the, we're cutting. It's not finish. So now I resorted to my favorite, the caulking. That's the dry brush side. So I just, you know, I, I don't want to be wasting all that time. I just wanted to show it. See, I put that paint in there and that's ready to go. There's our bathroom error. See, they didn't wipe their caulking. That's the error that they made. We don't do that because we're professionals, right? Even if you're a do-it-yourselfer, just learning. Professional is about attitude. It's not necessarily your skill. You have to have a professional approach to what you're doing in order to be called a professional. What if a guy knows what he's doing, but doesn't? he's not a professional? Because his attitude is terrible, he shows up late, and he doesn't give it his all. He's not a professional. Okay, folks, I'm using a one and a half inch nap roller. Different than the roller I began with on this wall. This is one and a quarter inch. One and a quarter inch nap. The, the fuzzy is called a roller or a sleeve, okay? The thing that holds that roller is called a roller cage. Some people call it a roller handle. But the sleeve is the fuzzy. It has a nap length, nap, and that is, in this case, it's one and a quarter inches. Okay, just so you know the terminology. Now, let's talk about how to apply that paint. You see that the perimeter is already cut. What does that mean, cut? Well, you see blue at the top, on the side, right? So it's cut. My roller can't get in there. I need to cut it in with a brush. They call it cutting. And so I begin to roll. How many columns, if your roller is nine inches wide, how many columns of nine inches can you get from top to bottom from one loaded roller? 
I don't know. It depends on what your wall is. Is it flat paint? Is it going to drink in that paint? Is it already painted freshly and you're doing your second coat? Generally, you will get one column of paint out of a loaded roller on a nine foot wall. Then you might go back up at the top, pull it back down again, overlapping the previous lap by 50%. So you get one and a half tops. Folks, if you wanna mess up a dark red wall, a dark blue wall, a black wall, load up your roller. If you wanna mess the job up, load it up, go up and down top to bottom, do another column, do a third column, and try to get a fourth column out of one loaded roller. I've seen it done on a red wall. It looked hideous, hideous. I couldn't understand why the customer who wound up hiring me didn't realize that when she was rolling the paint, the, the undercoat began to show. I, I didn't understand why she didn't perceive that. So if you want a rich, thick coat, you definitely want to stay within the limits of the capacity of your paint. Take a look at the universal application. Look at the wall. Now on the far left, it's beginning to dry. I can see it. There's less of a glare to it, so it's becoming flat. But the second part, beginning at that white little outlet on the bottom left-hand side of your screen, it's, it's all universal, isn't it? From that point going toward the right. That's what you want. We're keeping a wet edge. We're painting up against a previously painted wet column. So we're constantly moving forward, painting our columns vertically against wet columns. That's what it means to keep a wet edge. Now on the second coat, we're going to paint the wall all together. The top, and while the top is wet and the sides are wet, we're gonna start rolling it in vertical columns. But I just wanna show you something on the second coat when you do the cut. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Most painters do not do a second cut, most. Look at how you tighten up the line. Just just check this out, all right, as I do it. Remember, I showed you the various ways you could cut this line, right? And I'm going to employ the one that works best for me. I showed you several. But look at how I just tidied up the line. You see, on the first go-round, you can't get it perfectly straight. But here, since your surface is now freshly coated with paint, your brush glides Oh, it's true, it glides over that first coat. I mean, we're talking a fresh coat of paint that isn't pitted. So on the first coat, our brush did a little skipping, right? Remember how the brush skipped a little bit? Look, you see how it's skipping there? Well, on an old coat of paint, I mean, the paint is three to five years old that I was coating, but now that it's brand new, and when you bunch the bristles up like this, it just glides on it. You see that? There's no skipping now. See that? And there we tidied up our line on the second coat. Don't try to make it perfect on the first coat. Very difficult to do that, okay? And it's a lot of time, okay? So just take your time on the second coat, fill in those imperfections and go for it. Now you can see where my brush did a little skipping before, right? You might be going too fast, or it might have been a rough spot on the uh, that old coat of paint, but now I'm gonna make it perfect, watch this. Okay, come up a little bit, come up, come up, come up. Now I'm gonna go backwards.
We're creating an illusion, folks. It's gonna look strange. Look at that. Look at that now. Okay. One more time. Dip into my bucket here. We're looking to make the obvious straight. You're essentially using your eye almost like a laser level. Now, while our edge is wet at the top, we're now going to paint that. So now that we cut with a brush two times at the top, remember what the homeowner did with the brush, right? Perfect example. Now we have to be consistent with the texture on the rest of the paint job, which is stippled roller. What is stipple? You know the texture that is created by using a roller, right? You want to keep that around the perimeter, at the top and bottom, both sides. And so now I go up on the ladder and take my roller and horizontally roll it as close to that crown as I can get. I'm really attempting, when I do it, to get rid of the soft texture my brush made. Think of it like that. You wanna go as close as you can. And so, I now bring my roller all the way to the top of the wall, as close as I can get it to that crown. And what I will land on when I get up there is paint that has been applied with a roller. Don't be lazy, please. Don't go up there and say, ah, I know I should do it, but what the heck. You see those lights? Or you see that light right near the wall? It's gonna show. Lights are bad. They, they're the enemy of the bad painter. So now I'm gonna get up on that ladder again and horizontally roll my paint as close to that crown as I can get it. And then I'm gonna come back down, keeping a wet edge. You see the paint is wet to my left? Well, the edge of it is wet, right? So it's a wet edge. You don't wanna let that dry. You don't wanna let it dry because then you won't have a wet edge, you'll have a dry edge and you're going to see the point at which the wet met the dry because we don't paint up against dry edges because you'll see it. And you see, I only go piecemeal at the top. Why? Because I want it to be wet when I get to it. Right? That's what it means to keep a wet edge. You want to paint up against the top part while it's wet. The side part, which is wet, if you're painting up against something that's dry, you can, you can forget it. You're going to have to paint it again. You see that metal thing? That receives the pressure from my arms, pushing the roller onto the wall. Consequently, the roller on the side of that metal elbow is going to create a ridge. For the professional, the ridge will be imperceptible, but nonetheless, it'll be a ridge. But look at the direction in which I'm traveling. I'm gonna run over the ridge, because I'm going right. I'm going toward the elbow, which is making the ridge, and then I roll over it. But sometimes, if you guys don't know how to roll a wall, and you're rolling it 
in the wrong direction and your elbow's on the left and you're rolling toward the right, well, guess what? You're making ridges on the wall and you're not rolling them over because your roller is inverted in your hands. And so if you're moving toward the right-hand side of the room, rolling the wall, the roller elbow will be on the side of your body in the direction you're painting. So I'm going right, correct? Technically, not right now, but I'll explain what I'm doing right here. I'm moving toward the right. See, that's one column. Now I go to the right of that. I put my other column. I'm moving to the right. And so the elbow that's going to make a ridge, although it's imperceptible, is going to get run over by the rest of my roller. And so there won't be a ridge. But if you reverse that, and the elbow's on your left, and you're moving right, oh my goodness, you're going to have a ridge every single time you make a new column. So please understand not to do that. Be cognizant of that as you paint. Look at the beauty of that paint right now. Look at that screen that's three quarters painted. Look at that. Do you see anything there imperfect? Look at the beautiful light hitting that wall. It's showing everything and no imperfections. That's what I love about painting. You see, I just flipped, you see, I just flipped the roller. Did you see that? Sometimes our roller starts getting flat. It does. And so if you flip it, you get a little more paint out of it. You delay the dipping. It's a little, it's a little subtlety. But we torque the wrist when we do that. If you're experiencing your roller flattening out, you'll see that if you simply torque the, the pressure on the roller, you'll, you'll make up for that. Just like a pilot in a plane, he loses an engine, he does something to one side of the plane to compensate for the lack of thrust that we were getting from one of the jets. So if your roller goes down on one side and gets flat, you can simply torque the, the pole in your hand by increasing the pressure on the side of the roller that has more paint in it. And you'd never notice a difference if you're a pro. Okay, there I go. Why am I landing 15 inches to the right? I said in a previous video, you don't want to take a loaded roller and start right up against the column you just finished. No, you're dropping too much paint too close to it. Right? It's like uh, if you had something leaking outside your house. You'd go over near the grass, right? Let it leak into the grass. Well, if you have a loaded roller, you want to get all of that paint off off to the side, far away from your perfect columns to the left. And then you can dip in it and bring it to the left. And that's all I'm doing. I'm just using the wall to receive all of that paint. And then I go to the left. See that? See, I dip into it again and I take it to the right. That's all I'm doing. It doesn't change the theory of keeping a wet edge or moving in one direction. See, that's all wet there, and it's not drying. You're not going to start drying in 30 seconds. Now I go up to that column, and I'm gonna overlap it. There I go, I'm overlapping my column. And I think I'm gonna put one more on the, on the end of that wall. Hmm, I guess not. Let's see. Look at that. Look. Oh my goodness, isn't that gorgeous? Look how perfect it is. Uh, and let me tell you something. 
Half of it's technique and half of it's the paint. This stuff, I have to say, it's excellent. It's excellent. Don't expect to get good results from cheap paint. Okay? Here's that side we were talking about. I showed you two ways to paint the edge of a dark paint color on textured surfaces. You could use the tape as I did here and caulk it, or you could simply take that long time consuming process. Which would you rather do? Would you rather paint it with a brush and paint it four or five times with a brush, or would you just rather caulk it like that? I'm sold on this part. Okay, rather than make you think that I never make mistakes, my paint has bled under my tape, so I'm going to come around with my three, two and a half inch purdy, and I want to show you how I go right up against there. I'm holding the brush from the handle because if I hold it too close to the bristles, I'll be painting on top of that blue. Look at how the forward edge bristles hug the contour of that trim. I can get right in there, right up against there, the most minute blue on the white. I can do it. And believe me, my hand is at the top of that handle. This is the part I love. This is the challenge. Where the video is coming to an end. And I have, what you see is a headlamp. I have a craftsman light on my head. You need a light, folks. If you want to paint and you want to get into details like this, you need a light. In fact, customers watch you. If somebody says, do you need more light? You know what they're saying. You need more light and I want a good job. If somebody says that to you, they've detected that you're not doing your best. That's the only reason why people would say, you need more light when you're working in their house. See how I'm bringing that paint? Now, don't forget that the homeowner got blue paint on this trim. And uh, he kind of peppered the trim with his purple paint or this blue paint. So I saw a lot of snowflakes down there. Blue snowflakes. But you manipulate that brush and you got to just go easy, slow, because this is something if your hand jumps, you just, you got to paint your blue now. And so I'll just let you watch and see how I do it. This is a procedure that you have to perfect on your own. 
I guess what I'm showing you here is that it's possible for you to get that brush and make that white line straight. The video helps you realize what kind of brush does this type of detail. Now, anybody who's going to spend their time painting, you know you can't go get a cheap brush, right? You're looking at a $17 brush in my hands. Now, to me, that's not expensive, but to some people it is. And so they might try to go with a cheaper brush, like an $8 brush. Please, you're not going to get these results from a cheap brush. Look at that. That's just perfection. Look at how that brush... I'm just holding that brush. The brush is doing the work, really. I'm just guiding it along. You know what I want to tell you at this part of the video is when you have choppy trim don't do it in one don't do it in one attempt to cover it keep going back and forth your hand is learning the 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 contour right here and so when you come come up on your first pass you you get within an eighth of an inch, you come up on your second pass, you'll see that I keep hitting the same area. What am I doing? I'm playing cat and mouse with that trim. I don't wanna go up onto that blue wall. So at the end, you finally get it. You're right where you have to be. So you'll see that you can't do it on the first pass. You'll need to go back and, and your brush doesn't know how far it needs to be until you visually examine the effect after you pass it. So go once, and then go another time if you need it, another time after that. Eventually you'll get it, it'll look perfect.
in the next segment, I'm going to now show you how to perfect the line at the crown molding. Now to keep in mind that the paint has just dried. I'm going to be using a material that is very friendly to newly dried paint. And it's a tape. Don't listen to painters when they say, oh, I don't use tape, that's for amateurs. That means that they make imperfect lines. That's what that means. Okay? And they're also lazy. There you go, folks. I've isolated the crown molding with my tape, revealing a blue line. Oh, yeah. Which means that the blue line was on the molding. Why is that? Because the bumpiness required so much attention that an eighth of an inch, remember I showed you the little graphic that said unacceptable. And if you want to be perfect and you want to step up your painting game for your beautiful wife at home, she wants that place painted, or for your customers that keep you in business, this is what you're going to do, folks. Look at that. Perfection. I'm using clear caulking, but you could use the white too because you're painting against white. Look at the results. You see that? I'm a little on the crown. Can you blame me? I'm painting over texture. Put some caulking in there. Clog that tape so that you don't have to now touch up your blue again. Or your white again. Get that caulking in there. Put your headlamp on. You want to see what you're doing. Press that in. Not like the bathroom guy before. Press it in. Have a little rag. Clean that off. Look at that. And now look at the results. And now you can be generous with your paint because you're painting it over such a highly pigmented color, right? You gotta put it on thick and you don't wanna be up there all day. So one thick coat suffices. Yeah, you could argue I'm putting two coats because I keep going back and forth and adding the paint, but I finish in one direction. I pull it all the way now, come on. Pull it all the way. Look at that. And that's what makes the line perfect. At the end of the video, you're going to see how perfectly straight these lines are. I don't like crown paint on my wall, and I don't want wall paint on my crown. Do you? Neither does your customer. Let's make it right. Step up your game, because guess what? You're going to be known for this. Look at that perfection. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? tape. This is paint for sensitive surfaces, remember. I mean, can you think of a tape that can go on just painted walls without pulling that paint off? Think about how high quality that paint is and think about how high quality this tape is. Now, this happens to be a product. You can get this. The equivalent is frog tape, or this is actually a, a paint for sensitive surfaces made by 3M. So here we are winding up the job. I touched up my crown. I touched up the, the wall where my roller missed a speck here, a dot there. Look at the luster of that paint. The luster is the universality of the color and the texture and the reflection of the light. There's nothing trapping the light. And we did a great job on the texture. 
What a beautiful job that this paint does. Designer series from Sherwin Williams. Just finishing up caulking. This is the left hand side of the living room wall. This, this was the wall that we had to fix, texture, and repaint. I'm using paint tape on top of freshly dried paint. So we want to go and spend the money, right? This is not cheap stuff. And look at the results, though. I can't emphasize enough of using clear caulking. This is where you would want to use clear. That's beige paint on the left, obviously blue on the right. So you want to use translucent caulking. It dries, it goes on white, dries clear. Therefore, it's translucent. It will not inhibit the brilliant navy blue color on your right, nor will it make the paint on your left look darker or lighter. Now, if we were painting against white, we could certainly use white. When you pull your tape after you have caulked against it, if a white edge is something that's not going to look right on the color you're using, then you use clear. But when you're painting white, then you can go ahead and use white caulking. Right? Okay. One direction, we're near that navy wall. We don't want to be spitting that beige wall paint onto our beautiful new wall. As you can see, this is a foam roller, and because it's foam, it gets into the contours of that very tricky texture on the edge. Great tool, please use it. And what I like about it is that you start off slow, because guys, once you get the color onto the blue, then you gotta wait till it dries, and then you gotta touch up the blue. Inevitably, you get the blue back onto the, to the beige. It doesn't end. This tool allows you to touch up this light colored paint and be done with it. You don't wanna be getting that blue paint back out again at the end of the job. Look at the perfection there. Isn't this a great tool, this foam roller? Now, it looks perfectly straight, right? But it's an illusion. Why is it an illusion? Our texture is on the corner. We know it's not straight. How could texture be perfectly straight? But look at the... When you have a dramatic color change from that navy to that beige, it gives you the illusion that it's straight because you're separating two drastically different colors. And as long as you're not a slop with your roller... It gives the impression that the, the corner is perfectly tight. I mean, it's almost perfect. But I mean, how could it be? There's texture on it. But, it. but isn't that amazing? You would think that that was a perfectly flat wall and a perfectly flat corner. It's not. It's got texture there. I'm just emphasizing how good that roller is to be able to do that. Now... The guy using the roller happens to be very good too. And if your corner 
is still light and you, you, you're not hitting those textured pieces in the various areas, just tweak it, put a little pressure on it, that's all. 